Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, and I'm sorry we're late today and that's entirely down to me because uh, this morning I've been attending albeit virtually uh, the British Irish uh, Council Summit uh, actually being hosted in Northern Ireland so it's a shame I couldn't get there but uh, the common theme uh, throughout and there were some technical issues so I couldn't make my second speech in relation to recovery matters but I could speak fully and heard fully the comments in relation to Covid uh, and I'll refer to those again in a moment or two. Now what we said when we had the Bailiwick blueprint and when we've made our more recent announcements is that we keep everything under review because our overwhelming consideration uh, is uh, as a civil contingencies authority is to ensure that the interests of our citizens are protected completely and that our citizens remain safe. And that's whether you're a citizen at uh, one day old or 100 years old or in between. So that's our prime, prime duty. Now, just about everybody's heard about the Delta variant. Now, at the British Irish Council, you've got the First Ministers of Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland. You've got the Shiok and a Senior Minister from the Republic of Ireland. And you've got, of course, the senior ministers from, or the chief ministers from Jersey and the Isle of Man, and two uh, UK cabinet ministers. And everybody mentioned the Delta variant. Now, the Delta variant is something that's come about in recent weeks, and it has influenced and has influenced the decision we're going to uh, be announcing shortly uh, in relation to travel arrangements. Dr. Brink will speak shortly about the efficacy of the vaccines against the Delta variant uh, and other matters. Now, uh, in my uh, layman's terminology, the Delta variant uh, is more resistant to uh, the first dose, or should I say the first dose of any vaccine you, you get, is not as effective against the Delta variant. The second vaccination uh, makes that difference. And therefore, you're not as protected as you would be uh, in relation to the Delta variant until you've had both your uh, doses. And that is a significant factor, especially with the summer season coming about. So what the Civil Contingency Authority uh, decided yesterday is that from the 1st of July, and this will be kept under periodic review, we'll be reviewing it every two weeks, that people who uh, come from or are travelling to uh, the uh, common travel area, which is Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, uh, Jersey and the Isle of Man, if they've had both their vaccinations and 14 days thereafter has elapsed, they'll be able to travel into and out of the common air, uh, travel area without restrictions. That won't apply elsewhere. In relation to we were going to have a, follow the UK and have a green, amber and red traffic light system, we're now going back uh, to having the categorisation of regions and countries. So one, two, three, four, and again, Dr Brink will explain more about that in due course. And the reason for that is because we have, as I've already said, to make sure that the public are protected. But equally, we want people to be able to travel as soon as they can. Now, we've got a very high number of people over uh, the age of 18 who've been vaccinated, but we've still got a long way to go. And uh, the present uh, estimate is that by the 3rd of August or thereabout, every adult 18 years and above who uh, wants to have the vaccines will have had both their vaccinations. And that means two weeks thereafter, they'll have the best protection that they possibly can have. So that takes us to around the 17th of August, and you've got to give a day or two of tolerance uh, either way. So therefore, we're at this stage going to take the step that we've said, i.e. it is more restrictive, but it still is open in relation to the common travel area as I've described it. Now, I wish we could do more. Uh, I wish that uh, we would be able to say that nothing has affected uh, the decisions that we've made previously. But it was made clear that those were caveated by changes, and changes can uh, happen so quickly. Uh, and as I say, my colleagues uh, on the British Irish Council were making exactly the same point in relation to their various jurisdictions. So we're dealing with a, a variant where the transmissibility is higher, and the efficacy of the vaccine is poorer for people who've not yet had both uh, doses. So that's where we are. We'll keep the matter under review. We hope to have better news as time goes by. But again, I make no apology for this change in policy because we are acting in the best interests of everybody. Dr. Brick. Thank you very much, Deputy Fairbrush.
So just to remind you about the principles about the Bailiwick Blueprint and the exiting lockdown is we want to learn to live responsibly with COVID and that remains our aim. Long term, we need to be able to do that. We also want to learn to, we want to move towards less restrictive travel. That remains a fundamental aim as well. Sustainable long-term recovery plan, but throughout the Bailiwick Blueprint, we acknowledge the uncertainty. And a specific uncertainty that we raised was the emergence of variants of concern with increased virulence, increased transmissibility, or decreased vaccine efficacy, or a combination of those. So on the 20th and 8th of May at the press briefing, I talked about things that worried me. And at that stage, the Delta variant was was still called B617.2. Um, and that's a variant, of course, that originated in India. And we said that was a concern for us. Other variants of concern emerging remained a concern for us. Outbreaks or um, areas developing high prevalence levels was a, was a matter of concern. And if a particular region had a low vaccination rate or there was no reliable data. So those were the things that worried us on the 28th of May. And if we come forward to today, in summary, the thing that worries me today is the Delta variant. Now, what we're seeing is an increasing prevalence of infection across the UK. And the most recent data that I've seen is that 91% of the new cases are in fact caused by the Delta variant. So. If we look at this as a variant of concern, we're looking at what worries us. So first of all, the increased transmissibility worries us in the region of about 50% increased transmissibility if you compare it to the Alpha variant, which was previously known as the Kent variant. The vaccine efficacy has decreased, and I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. And there is a question about increased hospitalizations. There's not enough data um, to support, to, to give us firm details on this, but there is a feeling that you could see increased hospitalizations relating to this variant. So I went back and looked at some of the UK data, and this is the most recent UK data. So if you look at the data from the 4th to the 10th of June, that's yesterday, that if you looked at that seven-day period, the COVID cases were up by 62% when you compared it to the previous seven days. So that's the number of cases. We're obviously... We look at the number of cases, but what is the impact of those cases? So um, going back to the hospitalizations, the latest data from the UK was the 31st of May to the 6th of June. And you're looking at about a 7.1% um, increase in hospitalizations compared to the previous seven days. And over a period of a week in June, you're looking at about a 1.9% increase in death rates. Now, what we don't know is what's going to happen over the next two to three weeks. Are these going to plateau off or are these going to continue to increase? So we essentially are in a situation where we have a lot of unknowns at the moment. And that's why we need to pause and look at how the best way, um, look at the best way for us to go forward. Now, just looking at infection prevalence, which was the first issue that I brought up as a matter of concern. Now, if you look across England, you can see the top black um, line is the northwest, and there's clearly a steep increase in the number of cases um, to above 200 per 100,000 um, in the last time we measured it. But if you look at the other areas of England, you're seeing that upward trend across all of those areas. So um, the England, London has gone up to to around about 80 per 100,000. If you look at the um, south um, southeast of um, of um, England, it's going up, and the southwest has just gone onto the watch list today. So across the whole of England, you're seeing increasing levels of infection. So if we then look at um, other areas, and this is now Scotland, and I'm not going to go through the whole of the United Kingdom. I've just picked out some areas that may be of interest. Um, and you can see Scotland East and Scotland West are both going up. But you also see um, Scotland North on the rise. And Scotland North is about to go into Category 4 and breach 100 per 100,000. So you're looking again at a deteriorating picture. The Prevalence in the Scottish islands is obviously lower, but they've had a few cases there as well. Across to other um, neighbours, um, Wales is in general doing well. There's a slow increase in the number of cases, but in fact, Wales has stayed in Category 2, with most regions being under 30 per 100,000. So an encouraging picture in Wales, but a gradual increase there as well. So... 
If we then look at the second thing that worries us, which is vaccine efficacy. So we're seeing an increase in the prevalence of infection, but importantly is to look at vaccine efficacy. Now, the original Bailiwick blueprint was modeled on the vaccine efficacy of the alpha variant. So that was a variant that originated in Kent. And what was clear from that variant is you got significant protection after the first dose of vaccination. So if you recall the date of the 1st of July, that date was modelled where all of the over 50s had had their first and second dose of vaccine and were more than two weeks after their second dose of vaccine, but also the under 50s had completed their first dose of vaccine. So it was modelled on the basis that you'd have significant protection on the first dose of vaccine for the um, alpha variant. If you then compare the alpha and the delta variant um, with um, the first and second dose of vaccine, you'll see a some 17% reduction in vaccine efficacy on dose one if you compare the alpha to the delta variant. So that reduction in vaccine efficacy. If you look at dose two, you can see there is a modest reduction in vaccine efficacy, but not nearly as pronounced as the um, redu reduction dose efficacy after the first dose of vaccine. So we're looking at an increasing prevalence with a variant of, a variant of concern um, against a background of reduced vaccine efficacy against dose one of the vaccine. And that forms the scientific evidence for re-looking at what we should be doing. So if you then go to our vaccination update, we know that um, by the 1st of July, we should have full protection for all the over 50s, but we will not have full protection for the under 50s. And we think by the 1st of July, about 30% of those people will have full protection. Now, obviously, the the, um, the larger number of cases you have, the more cases that are going to be ill, the more likely they are going to be admitted to hospital, the more likely they are to then have consequences of things like long COVID. So there are a number of things. There's the hospital admissions, the long-term consequences. But if you look at where we are in our vaccination program and focusing on the over 18s, you can see 54% of the population have had two doses. So we're doing well, but we really need to get to the over 80% of the population having had um, two doses, of the over 18s having had two doses. So it, the vaccination program is progressing well, but the emergence of the Delta variant is a game changer because we need that second dose of vaccine to give us population-based protection. So... We talked always about our tipping point, and we said most of the heavy lifting is now going to be done by vaccination. But what we need now know is that heavy lifting needs to be done by two doses of vaccination. Now, our situation differs from elsewhere. Elsewhere have got internal restrictions on their community. So they've got mask wearing under circumstances, they've got gathering size limits, they've got um, no standing bar service, clubs aren't open. So it is an entirely different situation. So our only non-pharmaceutical intervention that we have, other than our hand washing um, and so on, is our, are our border controls. So they form our main defense from a non-pharmaceutical intervention. So I think that's really important when you consider the measures, that you consider them in a whole. You can't compare one region's border restrictions without looking at what internal measures they've got, because it's always going to be a balance between the two. And so finally, when we now look at the Bailiwick blueprint, up to the 30th of June, we, uh, can, we will continue doing a focus on prevalence and doing our regional categorization. But what we want to do from the 1st, July, 1st of July is essentially a hybrid of what we were going to do before. So people that have been fully vaccinated and are more than two weeks post their second dose of vaccine, traveling to and from the common travel area, are very likely to be protected against infection. And if they are un in the unlikely event of them getting infected, they are far less likely to transmit infection. So we feel that that group of individuals should be able to travel unrestricted within the common travel area. We will continue our country and regional classification. However, we are going to look at it every two weeks. So every fortnight we'll be having a look at it. It's an unstable situation. It might be that things improve rapidly, which we can review, but it also might be that things deteriorate. So we just don't know at the moment. The ultimate aim 
is to move to where we want to be on the 1st of July, which is to have full and unrestricted travel within the common travel area and then align internationally to the green, amber and um, red international UK tra traffic light system. So it's a bridging program that we're presenting today allowing as much free travel as we can, but at the same time trying to protect the bailiwick from developing community seeding that could get out of control and at the worst case present us with a third wave of infection. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brink. Uh, I think just a couple of further points, if I could, before I pass over to Mr. Whitfield. Uh, what we want to avoid is polarisation of, uh, of our community. And I mean, for example, somebody contacted me recently, a care worker, who'd done everything, been away to Jersey, but done everything that she should, and was then abused by some colleagues who didn't understand, uh, or didn't want to understand, uh, the nature of what she'd done and the fact that what she'd done. Let's not do that. Let's not Guernsey together. Let's respect people and assume people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And also, I mentioned the uh, BIC, British Irish uh, Council, earlier. We're the only jurisdiction that I'm aware of it there, and probably beyond there, where we haven't had uh, to wear face masks, we haven't had uh, to social distance, we haven't had uh, restrictions on going to a pub or a restaurant or many other things. We can do all of those things because of what we've done so far and we want to continue that. Others are still striving to get to that standard. Now I'm going to turn over to, uh, pass over to uh, the Chief Executive because he's going to talk about vaccination certification and we'll progress on that. And really the announcement that we've made today, what changes, what technical questions that that might throw up. So Paul. Thank you, David. For, whilst we'd all prefer that July the 1st could go ahead as planned, the protection of our community is paramount. However, the timeliness and performance of our vaccination programme does mean significant numbers of our community will still be able to travel within the common travel area without restriction, despite the rising prevalence and risks arising from the Delta variant. Together with colleagues in other jurisdictions, we've been working on providing the necessary proof of vaccination for all those vaccinated here and wishing to travel without restriction within the common travel area during this bridging period. This will give a common standard of security in both letter and digital format, not only for returning to the bailiwick, but if necessary for travelling further afield should it be required. Importantly, from June the 18th, we will begin to issue the formal proof of vaccination letter by post to everyone who has already had their second dose of the vaccine. And from that point on, everyone will receive their letter soon after their second dose is administered. Please note, as mentioned by Deputy Furbrush, ability to move through the blue channels as described will not be possible until 14 days have passed after your second dose has been administered. Anybody wishing to visit the bailiwick and so has been vaccinated under the programme of their own nation will need to request a proof of vaccination status from their jurisdiction. We understand that there is currently up to a 14-day wait in some areas, so this should be factored into any of their travel plans. Details should be checked with the relevant authority of that jurisdiction. For returning bailiwick students, we are developing an online form that will be available from next week to be completed by any student currently attending university in the United Kingdom or overseas. Completion of this form will help us to establish their vaccination status. If they have not been vaccinated and they are returning home to Guernsey for the summer holidays, we will be asking if they wish to be vaccinated on their return here. If they do need an appointment, it will then be arranged for them at the Community Vaccination Centre. The Vaccination Centre continues to do an amazing job here at Beausajour. The last three weeks have seen approximately 4,000 doses a week achieved. We continue to move rapidly through our age groups, with the last cohort now being invited for their first vaccine. This will mean that all those eligible who have come forward and wanting a vaccine will have had both doses by uh, August the 17th, which is really positive news for our community. There's been significant pressure on the vaccine scheduling team, but additional resources are now reducing the waiting times on the lines and ensuring that those who want to be vaccinated can be booked in promptly. As always, we encourage everyone who receives their letters to book their vaccine, vaccine as soon as possible. And finally, I would like to make observation that we're seeing increasing delays moving passengers through the, the ports, particularly as the numbers have risen. All travellers entering the bailiwick are still required to create a travel tracker account online before you travel. 
you must then complete your travel history within two days of your return and no earlier. The travel tracker is a significant part of our ongoing surveillance and monitoring in place to protect our community and indeed help maintain the on-island restriction free environment mentioned by Deputy Furbrush. Once you've created a travel tracker account, please remember to take your smartphone, tablet or laptop with you when you travel. We are experiencing delays as a result of arriving passengers who have either not created a travel tracker account or forgotten to travel with their mobile device. This means the same information has then to be inputted by our welcoming team upon arrival. We want your return or arrival in the bailiwick to be as smooth and hassle-free as we can. Please look up the travel tracker requirements on the COVID-19 website where all the details can be found by clicking on the travel requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, your questions. Uh, Matthew Leach, the Bailiwick Express. Um, from the 1st of July, um, what about uh, people under the age of 16? So if you're, if you're a parent and you're, and you're planning to go away and you have children, young children, are there plans to vaccinate them? If not, they obviously won't be getting their double vaccinations. What happens then? So thank you. And I think that's a question that we're looking at very carefully. Our current plans that we're looking at is that children will carry the vaccination status of their parents. And it's all about risk reduction. Nothing we do as we move forward is going to eliminate a risk. So they would carry the vaccination status of their parents, but with a caveat of um, we would probably do some additional testing. So we're working out the, the finer details of that. But that's the, our overall plan. But we will be producing more details on that. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, yes. Louisa from Channel TV, are you anticipating more calls to the vaccine centres as a result of this and have you got more staffing to accommodate that? Yes, we, we would expect that. Now there's a little bit about certainty about what's likely to happen for, for the 1st of July. I think uh, people are looking, looking at the sort of booking patterns of travel arrangements and forecasting. People are waiting to see what happens. They're actually booking later uh, and more last minute. Uh, so that's quite difficult to plan against. So, but we are really well equipped at the um, vaccination centre here and the scheduling have lots of capacity and will we'll, we'll, we'll help to uh, make sure people are booked in. Thank you very much. Uh, Ewan Duncan from BBC Currency, just ag again for you, Paul, on the, on the same topic, I suppose, is that I know that you've said at regular press conferences, people that have been sitting on letters, not booking appointments. I suppose now the announcement today might force people to think, actually, I will book in for my vaccine. I do want to, to travel or whatever. But I suppose assurance for the, for the younger people that these people and th that are older than them won't be prioritised because they've sat on the letter. It's, mm -hmm. it's a first come, first served. I think it's a very good question and the scheduling team uh, assure us that actually uh, our young people who have been patiently waiting at the end of that list will actually stay on their, their, their group and will not be put back because of those people now wanting the opportunity to travel but are older suddenly saying I will have a vaccination. So they will be, those that are catching up will be weaved into the scheduling but we won't put those that are in the correct age group. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Zoe from the Guernsey Press. Is it still the case that COVID has the greatest um, threat posed to elderly people and people who are clinically vulnerable, or are the variants sort of shifting that situation? Um, so yes, overall, the age-based morbidity and mortality definitely holds true together with certain vulnerable groups. What we are potentially seeing with the Delta variant is there's some evidence of increased hospitalizations, but it's not clear exactly what these hospitalizations constitute, whether there's an association with either no vaccination or partial vaccination. There's a bit of anecdotal evidence. I think what is clear is if your community becomes seeded and you get a third outbreak or a third wave, is that if you see an increased number of cases, you're going to see an increased number of severely um, seriously ill, ill people. So it is to a degree a numbers game. Um, but to answer your question directly, yes, morbidity and mortality is more common in the over 50s. Thank you. Question, Matthew. Thank you. Um, do we know if unvaccinated people will be more vulnerable to this more transmissible variant if vaccinated people are travelling freely between here and the um, CTA and potentially picking up this new variant? So we know that um, the vaccine is um, 
is effective at preventing severe disease um, as well as um, has an effect against preventing infection. We also know that if a, if a vaccinated person does become infected, they have lower amounts of virus in their respiratory secretions and so for, therefore are less likely to um, transmit the virus as well. And as I said, nothing we do now is going to be risk-free, but we are going to have to take those, those steps forward. So it's all about risk mitigation, risk reduction. And we've done things, for example, like keep our clinical helpline open so that people have access to free testing. So if they have symptoms, no matter how mild, to come forward for testing. So we're trying to wrap around, um, wrap around um, security around everything that we're doing. But everything is going to have an element of risk. It's now making that risk as low as we can. Thank you. Uh, you and Duncan again from BBC Guernsey. A uh, question for you, Dr. Brink. I suppose, you know, what you just, just said, you know, you, you're looking at the risk and, and analysing it. From the 1st of July, obviously, we, I'm sure we will see more cases uh, come to the island. In the UK at the moment, it's about 90% of this particular variant, which I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, how much is that going to affect Guernsey in terms of there will be slightly more freedom of, of movement, especially those that have been vaccinated in the UK. Uh, how much of a risk is that for you? Well, I think that's a similar question to what, what Matthew asked, asked me is we are going to see cases in the community and we are going to have to um, contact trace, isolate and so on. And something that I, I didn't mention, which I meant to mention at the beginning, is we have completed the sequencing of the last isolate that we had on the island. And in fact, that was the Delta variant. And we suspected that clinically, um, basically the person had an extremely strong strongly positive result and had had one dose of vaccination and so it was a typical presentation for us of the delta variant so we've managed that which is why we did um, more um, broader contact tracing so we, we were very cautious we looked at that and we said this looks like delta variant to us and so we did some broader testing so there is a risk the risk is mitigated by our good testing capacity, access to free screening, the fact that an increasing proportion of our population is vaccinated. And once we get to above 80% of the over of the over 18s, our risk levels will go down. But there is there is always going to be an element of risk, but it's all about keeping that risk as low as possible in a way that we can manage it and live responsibly with COVID. And, and that's always been our aim. Any other questions? Uh, sorry. Thank you. Um, the people that travel through the, the blue channel, uh, they don't have to be tested on arrival or anything. What's the reasoning behind that? If there is a, a chance that when they're fully vaccinated, they could still pick up the virus, although it's the risk is significantly reduced. Well, but I'll come to Dr. Brick in a moment. The idea is that they have got much less risk of picking up the virus. Uh, and uh, because they'll have had their two vaccinations, they'll have had at least 14 days after the second vaccination, uh, and therefore they'll be as protected as is uh, possible. Uh, so the only way you would protect that would be you have no travel anywhere at any time. We've got to start opening the door, and that's the first step. It is a big step, but it's a step that we believe is manageable. But as Dr. Brink has said, uh, we're going to keep it under review, and if things need to change, we'll change that, Dr. Brink. And right. we'll have people that are negative on arrival and subsequently become positive. So we're never going to control for every single risk. So the idea is to protect our population as much as we can through vaccination, ensure that people have access to free testing, even if they have only a few symptoms, promote good hygiene, hand hygiene, and so on within the community. Stay at home if you're unwell. So it's that whole package that we need to put together. Just reliance on a single test on arrival is too narrow in my view. Next question. Sure. Is there an update on vaccinations for children potentially? So that's a an area that's being looked at by the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation and we're expecting an announcement imminently on that. Um, so, we'll, so we'll wait and see what they come with. And as always, we will follow JCVR recommendations. Okay, any other questions? Don't see, making sure, yes, sorry. Um, what happens if um, an 80 plus year old is traveling to Guernsey, they're fully vaccinated, but they don't have a mobile phone, they don't have a tablet when it comes to the travel traffic? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, th th they are few and far between, but there will be some cases where that's the case. What we, we, we would encourage is um, if, if, if the traveller is known, it could be someone leaving Guernsey and coming back, then speak to uh, relatives. It's perfectly acceptable if they speak to someone who's got access to a laptop or a computer and actually creates the account for that person. When they're away, actually, it, it, and again, they can ask someone to fill out the travel history for them. It'll just make it so much easier for that person to come through uh, the arrival port when they come into Guernsey and it'll not be a lot hassle-free. But if not, once that person uh, a arrives, they will be helped by the welcoming team. It'll just take longer. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions from anybody? I suppose, Deputy Fairbrush, for you, just to touch on, uh, you were obviously on the British and Irish Council before this, and, and yep. uh, I'm sure you speak to them reasonably regularly. Um, in terms of the experiences that they've had in their jurisdictions, uh, and I'm sure they were keen to learn from Guernsey and what we've done here, but it, are there things that you're taking away from, from how they're dealing with, the, specifically this Delta variant? Yeah, yeah, of course, we've taken away from things that they've got, but the fact is that at the moment, uh, our COVID cases are nil, uh, and there is, there is no reason. Nobody wants to restrict people's lives, whether it's a, a public gathering, whether it's going to a restaurant or you know, meeting 20 friends or whatever, uh, unless there's good reason. And it had to be very, very good reason. They've got more reasons than we've got. But, I mean, I learned a lot this morning, you know, from what they had to say. Uh, and uh, th there is that communication which goes between our various jurisdictions. Uh, so they do add to our knowledge, and I think we add to theirs. Any other I saw another hand. Yes, Louisa. Um, do you have any kind of update on the, the booster programme in, in the autumn? I know last time, was, yeah. um, a few weeks ago, there was a question over when the flu vaccine would be able to be administered and timings around that. Yeah, again, we're still waiting for data on that. I think there, there will be a booster programme. I think exactly what group will be boosted, whether it will be a homologous or heterologous boost, I think um, the jury's still out on that. So, again, we will wait and see see what advice we get from JCVR. It would be great if we could do a concomitant flu and COVID vaccine, you know, one in each arm. It would be great. <laughs> you know, one appointment, two jabs. Um, but um, so, so we're hoping for something like that. But those, those results haven't been presented as yet so it's like the children's we're imminently waiting for advice on children um, 16 to 17 year olds and on um, the booster program anything else I don't see any hands raised thank you very much everybody again for your perceptive questions thanks very much for listening everybody or watching uh, and as I say we'll keep you regularly updated and if there are any changes that will be brought to your attention without delay thank you very much everybody <laughs>